Welcome to another episode of All Over VoiceOver with Kiff VH. I'm your host, Kiff Vanden Heuvel, and welcome to the show. I'm so happy you're here, and I'm so happy to announce that I got a brand new sponsor. Um, I'm so uh, just honored that the Second City Hollywood Training Center is uh, sponsoring the show in part, and... Um, if you listen to this show with any regularity, there's one thing that you hear me so say, you know, week after week, and it's just, it's how valuable my improv training has been for not only my on-camera career, but for my voiceover career. And I don't think that there's any place better in, in the Los Angeles area than the Second City Hollywood Training Center. And not only do I teach there, uh, but the tremendous staff, the entire staff of Second City alumni and the teachers there just bring to life this fantastic curriculum of rock-solid improv training for every level of student, from folks who are just looking to you know, get a little bit of basic improv training to make their auditions and their film and TV work just come to life, to people who are really hungry for the entire Second City show crafting experience. Man, you can get it all. We've even got specialty workshops on acting and writing, and there's a directing program. I even teach an intro to voiceover class that I think is the best deal on VO training in town. It's an intro class, and it's just a nice way to get your feet wet. And exclusively for listeners of this podcast, you can get 50 Fifteen percent off your first session of improvisation by entering the code "all over" when you sign up online. That the code is "all over" a l l o v e r. Uh, man, come and learn from the best at Second City Hollywood and discover how improv can ignite your performance career as well. You can either call us at 323-464-8542 or go to www.secondcity.com and click the Hollywood Training Center link to take your life to the next stage. Oh, what a terrible pun. But it's true. Take it. Uh, I, Second City changed my life. And... Um, and I, I know so many people who have experienced that as well. So anyway, uh, great. So um, let me get straight to it. So my guests today are Bo Oliver and Samit Iyengar. They are my commercial voiceover agents at CESD. They're great folks with uh, amazing insight, and uh, I cherish our relationship, and, um, and I hope there's a lot of wonderful things that you learn from this conversation. Uh, without any further ado, here you go. It was funny. I remember driving over the first time I came to meet you and I was in traffic. And I was like, oh, I'll be there in 30 minutes. And it took me an hour and a half. And, <laughs> and I remember calling and you were giving me direction. Oh. And I got off the phone with you and I said, I'm going to work with this person for uh, for the rest of my life. That was good. That was seriously, like, it was just the nature of our interaction. How did you, What I mean, what's your... Are we taping now? Yeah. Oh, great. How did, how did we... Uh... <laughs> I wasn't sure. Right, good. exactly. Okay. How did you get, I mean, like, Go, going way back, like, you, uh, where are you guys both from? Um, well, I'm from New York, a city, born and raised, and I was actually represented by the original Cunningham when it was on, like, 29th Street, I No think. kidding! Yeah, I think it might have been on 5th Avenue or something like that at the time, and... Uh, you and your sister, right? Yeah, me and my twin, my twin sister, my older brother was also an actor, uh, and uh, I were all with Cunningham. And, uh, yeah, so when, after I graduated college, I reached out to Ken Slevin, the owner of CESD. At uh-huh. the, or at the time, it was Conning M. S. Gattapini. Okay. Uh, and he set me up with a job interview out here with the on-camera department. No kidding. Yeah. And so I've been here ever since 2002. Uh, why did you sort of peace out on acting? Did you feel kind of like you were – did you peace out on acting? Or were you kind of like once you got – you get to school? Or what was what was that genesis of the transition for you? You know, when you grow up in show business, um, it's hard to kind of imagine yourself doing anything else. And I know a lot of other child actors that I grew up with weren't really ever able to get out of the business. Even mm. though they might have had other interests, they just didn't really understand how to make the shift. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I was in college when the SAG strike happened. Oh. And so I saw a clear way to make a shift, but still stay in the industry that I loved so much. Yeah. And so that's really how it came about. But I really didn't still didn't really understand how to have a profession outside of the industry, hmm. uh, and that's kind of why I'm still in it. But uh, I really like this side a lot more, having a little bit more control. Hmm. I um, Yeah, I grew up uh, sort of all over, but kind of uh, ended up settling in Illinois, southern Illinois, and uh, always wanted to, I wanted to be a writer, director, you know, filmmaker, and all that stuff. And, oh, wow. Um, and I sort of took a detour, was a finance major for, you know, in college, and 
worked at a bank and hated it. So I went back to film school in <laughs> Chicago uh-huh. um, and then moved out here in 2002 and took a job as a voiceover assistant here no again kidding. at CED and never, you know, I had no plans on being an agent. I wasn't on my radar at all, but I, you know, I didn't even really know what voiceover was or that you could make a living doing it. But, you know, once I started to get to know our clients and got to be in the booth and directing actors and I kind of fell in love with it and fell in love with our clients and, you know, so just sort of worked my way up from there. But, That's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I, I love how, I mean, I, I love how, agency work it's very very unique and i mean i had a, a tiny I, I i know you guys i told you a long a while ago that i had i had interned at a talent agency for like four months for <laughs> for denny severe when it was the artist agency over on over by century city and just the amount of knowledge that you gain about this process from mm. that unique perspective is so significant you know and it's exciting you know because you you're changing lives on a daily basis, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. And it's all the same. I mean, we, you know, obviously CESD has all these different departments and everything. Agenting is kind of the same regardless of what, huh. you know, the aspect of the industry you're doing. I mean, there's su- certain differences, but it, you're still, you have to know your clients. You have to know what they can do. Yeah. You have to sell them. You know, you have to sort of be imaginative about how you're going to present them and get opportunities for them and and it's really kind of it's funny when I was working at the bank it, that was a, that was salesmanship in a way but it was huh. it just seemed so boring to me but this seems like you know something I can actually sell like I can sell our actors you know because yeah. it's actually fun you know and I believe in them you know so oh, that's great yeah that's right great. and also being a voiceover agent is Wonderful because it's all about people's abilities, not about the super, superficial. How do they look? Are they pretty enough? Right. Are they too chubby? You know all those things. So I've always really thought it's great because so often you know we get specs that are you know for thirty to forty years old. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean you put people who are thirty to forty. You put people who are vocally thirty to forty huh. or who connect with that age group. Uh, so it's really about the talents of the talents abilities more so than just the superficial elements of being an actor. That's, that's fascinating. I mean, that's one of the things that I really love about about voiceover in general is that that, that, that spectrum, depending on how you nurture and where you fall in that world, it's, I don't know, that's, I love it. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's I agree. Awesome. I mean, it's good to be it's good to be a man because men. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, men have a lot more staying power, it seems, than women sometimes huh. because I think that you know a lot of men work well in you know as you age into vocally an older category. There's there's different types of work. You know, you might not be the McDonald's announcer anymore, but maybe now you're the bank announcer or the car announcer. And then after that, you know, age category shifts, then maybe you're the narrator for a documentary. Huh. Or it's just that there's a lot of staying power to be a man yeah. in the voiceover world. I feel De- no, definitely. I mean, commercially, definitely, and obviously in promo trailer, it's just. You know, and that's just the way the world is, unfortunately. I guess for but, most industries, yeah. it really is that way, yeah. if we're honest, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Well, what do you, I mean, what things can people do to uh, to help you do your job better? I mean, as as a client, you know, my, my task is always like, how can, I, what, how can I arm you guys and give you the best ability to either sell me or submit the stuff that I send in? Like, what are, what are key things that you really uh, need from people that you represent to put your best foot forward? I, you know, I'm a big believer in, in training and retraining and, mm. and taking classes. And, you know, your life, ex- as your life experience changes, your read's going to change. And yeah. I think, you know, anything you do to sort of keep in touch with that. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, on that note, I agree. I think it's important to know what your signature read is and who you are reading the copy because that changes as you're a talent, you know? So uh, we hear this all the time, like, oh, but this book, this read used to book for me 10 years ago all the time. And so it's important to know, like, but you're not 25 anymore. Right. You're not the kid anymore. You're now the dad. You're a man. You've had children. You have different life experiences, like Sneet right. mentioned. So you need to stay in tune with who you are now because that's going to bring truth to the copy if you're trying to be someone that you're not in commercial copy, at least. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it just doesn't ring true, and, and that's not usually a, a read that's bookable. Now, obviously, it's different for animation. You could be anyone you want in animation, right. but commercially, it's usually a little bit more true to self and the signature read. Yeah, and and I, you know, and this seems so obvious, but you know, just uh, listen to commercials. I mean, we're, yeah. you know, it, 
listen to what the marketplace is and the what trends it's doing. are constantly changing yeah, in terms exactly. of style. Like it's I, I'm hearing more like announcery reads after this you know, what, like 10 solid years right. of like non announcery You still see that, but now it's becoming a little bit more, be more dramatic, and that kind of a, you know, <laughs> right. sort of a thing is creeping in, you know? Maybe they're trying to capture your your attention. It's so hard yeah. to capture, yeah. you know, the viewer's attention now because we're being, you know, smacked in the face with so many different types of social media. Right. You know, spots are getting shorter because, you know, younger people's attention spans are shorter. So I think they maybe need to just get in your face a little bit more and that has something to do with it, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. But, I mean, obviously there's still stuff out there for the conversational read, and that is the majority of the spec, I think, that we do yeah. get. But so often we find that on the copy it'll say, conversational, convers- conversational, not announcer, and then we'll hear the spot as it is finished, and they it's went the, the other way. Went way, you know, way. So. It's always that tricky thing, because as yeah. an actor, I, I can only imagine you don't know exactly. Because you want to give them what they're asking for, but yeah. you also want to indicate that you know they'll probably redirect you in the final session, and you right. want to let them know you can do that, too. So it's, you know, it's <laughs> right. always a tricky balance. Well, do you, I mean, in terms of preference... Like, do you want multiple takes on that to to sort of a to to hit that particular idea of like here's a nice honest conversational read and here's one that's a little bit more pushed or is that just more work for you guys and it's better to be like give me your best shot give me the best shot at you don't necessarily inundate me with a bunch of tracks you know what I mean I I don't mind multiple takes if if the copy's short enough yeah. and uh, and if they are truly different. Because you'll get a lot of people who will send you takes that, that are the same. You know, so huh. I'm listening to five of them, and I'm like, I can't tell the difference between them. But if they are showcasing a range, but not so far off of what you yeah. know they're asking for, I think that's okay. But if you have a long monologue or something, I think you know one or two takes is kind yeah. of two takes is probably pushing it. Yeah, you know, because now and we've heard this over and over again that ad agencies will really only listen to like five seconds, maybe. Right. And if right. they like what they hear, maybe they'll listen to more. But they've got so many auditions to oh, listen man. to. I mean, with yeah. Voice Bank, it's like, I mean, how many auditions are they getting from people all over the freaking country? Right. Yeah, hundreds. You know? hundreds. I mean, I will say this. I think that, you know, buyers all have different tastes. Sometimes people are hired and I, I am flabbergasted by what they went with. So it, it, everyone's unique, specific tastes, you know, are different to, for them. Yeah. But I will say that um, the conversational read, what they're usually asking for an authentic person for a lot of these different um, advertising campaigns. And if you give them multiple takes sometimes, I think it turns them off a little bit depending Uh on what the copy is because they want to believe that who they're hiring for this copy is that person. So if you give them three completely different varied takes, they'll be like, oh, okay, this is just a big phony phony person trying to be three different people. We want the guy who is that guy. Gotcha. So I think it, it really depends, obviously. But I think when it comes down to that read where, they, where they're where they throwing references in of celebrity people, for example, mm, yeah. who are that character, yeah. I think maybe giving multiple takes is not the best idea. Mm. Only because then it becomes clear that you are not authentic to that character at all. That's a good point. That and makes we, a lot of sense. And we do that with demos, too. Like, I... I I think a really good commercial demo sort of shows you shades of your signature read, yeah. you know, as Bo was saying. But uh, but if you have so much range on a commercial demo, then they're aware that they're listening to an actor, you know, and yeah. I think that can kind of work against you too. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm, and, well, because really I think, you know, back to the days before I was even an agent, um, you know, people's demos had like a wide range of stuff. You'd have a Texas cowboy mm. and your announcer, announcer game show guy and your commercial guy all in the same demo. And you would think to show them more would be better. But I think it just confuses people. And then they don't really remember any of it when yeah. it comes to a commercial demo. They'd rather have the guy who just is that on his own, you know? Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. That's really interesting. I'd never thought about it in that way. Of like, if you're going for someone's authenticity, you you should point the mic on, turn it on, and just get that. Yeah, I mean, it really is all about authenticity now in advertising, and that's why you see all these companies hiring like the real people to do you know Instagram posts right. or Twitter yeah. ads. It's all about like, oh, I actually use this brand. So I think that I mean, even when Smeet and I started in advertising. You know, you might put um, 
other ethnicities to play other ethnicities. Or you might have older women playing little boys. Right. But I think that doesn't really happen so much anymore. Right. And, mm. you know, ad agencies will even do, like, background checks before they hire someone to make sure that they've hired the authentic real thing for that because they don't want to risk pissing people off right. um, and hiring perhaps, you know, let's say a white guy to voice a black guy, which used to happen in the 70s and 80s and right. even into the 90s. But I think commercially that definitely doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, yeah. with this climate of whitewashing and all this other stuff, that's a, that's a major concern. And yep. all of a sudden a company just booking someone who they think is right for the thing gets a black eye from a PR standpoint. Right. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, I, we, I was working on a breakdown not that long ago where they were looking for a bunch of different ethnicities, and they, and I actually had to put the town that they were from and like go to that kind of level of detail. So, you know, yeah. everybody wants to do the right thing, and, you know, so it's just completely different now. Yeah, and also what's different, too, is, you know, I think ad agencies, because they want that authenticity, they'll put things on their breakdowns. Like, I might just be doing a casting for a radio spot, but they'll say they don't want anyone who's currently on, you know, a TV campaign for a car, and I'm casting for a radio for a car. And, you know, technically they're not allowed to ask that or, or ask you to check or hold any conflicts for that, but they don't want to hear you out there advertising for a different brand that might compete right. with them. So I think it's very important for talent to not, as much as people want to share, 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 just realize that people are looking. So, you know, mm -hmm. posting that TV spot that you did in 2010 on your website might come back to bite you when you're being considered for a different campaign um, several years later. Because um, that company might go to your website and check it out and go, oh, you know what? He was already the voice of a competing brand, even though it was six years ago. We just we want someone new, someone fresh, someone who's never lent their voice to a competitor before. It's just it's just another element that's being addressed now that that didn't used to be. Do you agree? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. I mean, with knowing that tone uh, in the sort of the the background check world of of that's going on now. I mean as people are working on producing their own demos and that kind of stuff. Like, is it better to kind of, from in your opinion anyway, to kind of be brandless in a way in terms of listing things that, you know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. 100%, I, I think. I, I right. agree. And yeah. especially with, like, high, uh, you know, comp highly competitive categories, let's say. Like, like cars. Fast food and cars. Uh, cars, and yeah. Like, I... You know, you don't want to do a really killer audition for a brand of a car, and then they listen to your demo, and your fake Buick spot is up there, <laughs> and they think right. that's a real one. You know, um, things like that. I, I, I think you you can still have the tone, you can have the body of the spot, just leave the product name off of it. Yeah, you know, they get the same vibe out of that. Yeah. So I think that's probably a smarter way to go. I mean. It's good to showcase the things that you do for voiceover that, you know, you might be credited for, like narrating a series or, you know, being a character on an animated series. But um, commercially, there's a reason there's no IMDb for commercials, you know, hmm. because you would have a resume of every p job you'd ever done and you wouldn't want a buyer to take you out of consideration because of something you'd done 10 or 15 years ago. But again, all these buyers, they, they want to believe that they found you. You have never done this before. Right. You're their voice and their voice only. There's just so much competition out there now. You know, you have people doing voiceover in New York, Texas, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and every other small town in between. Right. There's so many people that they can pick from. You know, we would like to believe that the most talented cream of the crop are in, you know, New York and L.A., where our offices are, obviously. Uh -huh. but, um, but you want... You don't want them to realize that they're hiring an actor. You want them to realize, think that they're hiring you and you only. Right. And they're the only ones that have ever hired you. Even though we all know that's not the case because how would you be able to sustain a career as a voiceover actor right. if you only worked for one client? That's right. That's, that's right. what annual guarantees are. Yeah, exactly. But those are few and far in <laughs> right. between. You know? That's right. Right. I mean, I would say maybe the only exception is if you're so ingrained in a campaign Right. Uh, like Dos Equis, you know, we right. have, you know, right. uh, where the voiceover is kind of like a celebrity in and of itself. Right. Yeah. That, I think, is fine to sort of promote, I mean, as long as you ha obviously have the, the permission, Dos Equis the, permission yeah, and stuff. Right. But, you know, because people l routinely, you know, refer to that kind of, you know, voice all the time. That's true. But, um, but uh, you know, if it's not something like that, you know, just leave the product name off, try to, you know, 
you know, promote the work, but not promote, promote the work and yeah. promote your skill set. Exactly. But don't, but don't, don't set yourself on fire accidentally by trying to impress everyone with look at all the the clients right, exactly. that I had on my reel. Right. And it's like, yeah, maybe maybe that's not such a hot idea. That's right. so interesting. Okay. That's interesting. <laughs> how, how do you? I mean, because I. After being in this business for a while and, and teaching, I get approached a lot from people about like, how do you get represented and, and all this other stuff. What's what's the process? Um, just because the nature of the way we connected is different from the way a lot of folks come in the door. So how do how do you discover folks that you're interested in representing or like or? Uh, in all sorts of ways. I mean, we get inundated with demos as you can imagine. We yeah. try to listen to everything. Um, you know, we get referrals. We have great relationships, uh, not only with us, but through our on-camera department and theatrical department with managers yeah. who will refer us great talent. Um, the thing I always go to, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, I came out here as a screenwriter and, and I had a class uh, with where everybody was sort of asking, how do you get an agent as a, as a writer? And the thing I always remember him saying was, if you get you know, your five minutes or your one shot with an agent, make sure you're prepared. And people always forget that. People yeah. always are ru- in a rush to sort of reach out to an agent. You know, anytime I'm out and somebody asks me, they ask for a card and then they send me an email right away. Make sure you're at the top of your game. Make sure you have a demo that reflects who you are. Uh, make sure you've taken classes because you, you really only get one shot. Yeah. And if I listen to a subpar demo, it doesn't matter how much you work six months later or a year later. Like, I'm, I'm going to remember that, you right. know, you weren't ready. And so just make sure, you know, put all the work in before you get to that point where you approach an agent. You know, I can't stress that enough. Yeah. That's... Well, and we want yeah. people also who, when they book a job for us are prepared so you know right. they need to be able to take direction very quickly so if they come in and they're you know interviewing to be with us or auditioning to be with us let's just say um if they're if they're not prepared or they don't take direction well or all of those things we're just going to assume that you know if you can't do it for us now you probably won't be able to do it on a consistent regular basis yeah. for our jobs or our auditions so i mean you know we're we're at a level cesd where you know we're lucky we represent some of the most talented voiceover actors in the business. And for that reason, you know, we can be selective about the people that we represent. But, you know, sometimes there are openings and windows of categories that we just realize we're not covered in. And, you know, more and more, there's other areas where we're open-minded to. Like, I think, you know, many, many years ago, voiceover actors were a specific, unique type of actor and uh-huh. you know you were just in that category oh you were just one of the voiceover guys but it's not really that way anymore uh-huh. most of our voice actors including yourself have you know very nice theatrical careers and some of them are you know big on camera commercial actors so it all kind of blends together and um the people who do voice it's not just your voiceover guys anymore it's oh no your voiceover actors are also on camera theatrical actors and commercial uh-huh. actors and and everybody kind of does it all now a little bit you know but there are certainly people that cannot do voiceover it just doesn't translate we've Mm -hmm. had you know major celebrities come in here who are insanely good actors just don't understand how to uh, lay down a piece of copy in 30 seconds and and sell a product they can't they can't get through it in that way because they're so used to using you know their physical features to express themselves they don't know how to do it in only words and so you know it doesn't it doesn't always work that's really, yeah. really fascinating to me. Well, I mean, what, what, what is, what do you? I mean, you guys have been around that and have seen that kind of stuff. What do you, what do you? I don't. Know, it's hard to word the question. It's in my head. Of like, how do you identify what those, those unique skill sets are that make us that that make uh, a successful voiceover actor? You know, it's, uh, you know, I think it's that ability to kind of just talk to one person. Hmm. You know, I, I, you know, just focus on what you're actually trying to sell and and having an opinion about it and letting that opinion come through. I I think a lot of people look at voiceover in terms of like, uh, you know, I don't know, narration, narration, like some sort of oratory kind of skill, you know, you're, you're projecting and everything. And it really isn't Uh about that. It's just sort of about telling a story, you know, intimately. 
And I think that, you know, being behind the mic is the na- most naked kind of acting there is. And and it's hard. And people get intimidated by that. And, yeah. You know, as Bo was saying, I've been, you know, as a boot director, watch these people who's work like who work all the time theatrically. You know, they're they're really good actors. But for some reason, they just sort of clam up. And, you know, I don't know if it's just because they're not hiding behind a character and now they're being themselves yeah, maybe. that they just can't, you know, get in touch with that but it's it's knowing who you are and what your opinions are and what your point of view is i think right if you, yeah. i mean if you read a piece of copy and the thoughts running through your head while you're reading the words are smile more wink here um sound raspy it's going to sound really inauthentic you know we huh. can hear when someone's right. got a smile on for the sake of having a smile on like it has to feel true and 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 we hear a lot of auditions and i guarantee the producers they hear more auditions than we do so wow. they uh, can certainly pick it up on it if we can. Hmm. You know, even if they can't articulate it, they'll know it. You know, they'll it'll sound fake. Yeah. Like they may not know why they don't it's like. Just like, it. Eh, yeah, not so much. Exactly, and it's kind of not specifically. It just, it, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't just not feel right. Right, right. We have a lot of younger actors who want to be that deeper voice trailer guy. Yeah. And it's funny because a lot of them will come in and I'll put them on a piece of copy because I think they're appropriate for it. But for whatever reason, they think it's supposed to be done a different way. And, and you'll hear people, put this voice on. And it just <laughs> sounds ridiculous because there's no reason they should be doing that voice. It doesn't sound authentic to them. Yeah. We have guys who have that voice and it yeah. works for them on that copy but you should be you not try to be this guy because that's it just sounds like me trying to be that guy right. Right. that's about exactly. how sellable exactly. it is you know <laughs> I, I, I feel that too like sometimes a piece of copy will come in and I'll look at it and be like oh they want it to be this sort of a thing and then I'll find myself doing that very thing and then not sending that take because listening back you go Mm. Right. And that, that's, that's not me. Right. That's not why Bo sent it to me. It's not why somebody wants me to read on this thing. It's it's you're sending me things for a very specific reason, and it's to be me, unless the direction exactly tells you to be something right. else. I mean, exactly. for for you, I mean, you've got such a great background in improv, like your Second City background, yeah. and um, I think that that's what I love that you bring to commercial copy so often. You know, you bring something unique, and and I personally like improving on the occasional commercial copy. Not every buyer does. You kind of have to know the brand that you're auditioning for and yeah. try to understand if, if they would be open to that. But I think it makes it more special. And um, I think that it's important to differentiate what we're talking about, though. We're talking mostly about, you know, the signature brand. There are obviously mm. pieces of commercial right. copy that we audition that might need the carnival announcer or the race right. car or race uh, car announcer yeah. or something over the top. In, in that case, it should be over the top. It's a character. Yeah. But, but the stuff that, you know, most voiceover commercial actors want or those blue chip you know sort of car brands or bank brands or insurance brands or pharmaceutical companies those brands are the ones that you're not supposed to be over the top with you know that's the one you're not supposed to put this voice on for (laughs) no investor is going to buy a bunch go go to Merrill Lynch Right. Right. the the AVO is kind of like this we take your money seriously you know what I mean yeah yeah yeah. that's (laughs) great oh man um well, oh shoot! I had a question and it, and it shot up. So you ask if there's editing? Oh, this happens to me all the time because yeah. Samit starts talking right. and I want to say something right. and I completely right. forget. Then the moment goes shooting by and you're yeah. like, "Oh what crap!" What was I talking about? It was such a great thought, yeah. and it's now it yeah, wasn't it's as great me. as I thought. Well, were were both of you guys? I know you were a booth director, so you said, were, "Did you booth direct as well?" Uh, no, I mean, I try to go in there regularly and direct, yeah. but I do find that our booth directors are our booth directors for a reason, right. and they probably direct direct a lot better than I do. I know what I want in my head, but mm-hmm. I am not able to verbalize it as well as perhaps Scott Forbes and Matt Shepley are, who are excellent booth directors. Our cur- Scott Forbes has been a booth director here for, uh, I don't know, 15 ten years. years. Oh, 10 years. Yeah. And Matt Shepley is one of our booth directors right now who used to be a producer uh, in advertising. So yeah. he's, you know, heard, you know, thousands and thousands of auditions and knows what people want so commercially he's amazing for us to have obviously oh he's great he's yeah. great and I, we know a lot of the same people from chicago which is That's super right. fun a lot of improvisers and stuff like that right so. i mean we get a lot of auditions through chicago so it's it's great for us to have his ear and and he knows what appeals to people in the chicago market i mean it's interesting because it you know everything's national now but the buyers that are in new york seem to be a, a 
find reads appealing that maybe California buyers don't. And huh. it, it does seem, what does Paul always say? The owner of the company always yeah, says. Yeah, so New York, in New York they sell what you need and in LA they sell what you want. So in other words, what? I mean, it's, which is which is actually because New York, I think, is the last market that is still as insulated as it is. I mean, huh. they're starting to kind of be more open, but you know, a lot of those advertisers will only cast in New York, and and it's mostly cast director, and it's these big sort of items like pharmaceuticals and you know toiletries and and things like that, cosmetics. Yeah. So those are the things that you need. You know, L.A. Right. That's where you get the car castings and the you know fast food and and you know so the fast. things that you want. So so it actually holds true. But it, it's just interesting that we get people from out here from New York who've lived in New York and had very successful careers. Yeah. And, and Chicago, this, this and Chicago. To Chicago, too, because Chicago uh-huh. is Definitely. similar to New York in that way. Yeah. And, and the reads are, are subtly different, you know, and, and they may not, it's, it's a little bit harder of a sell in New York. Huh. You know, here it's much more laid back, it's much more conversational, you know, it's like the surfer kind of thing right. a little bit, you right. know, it, it's just, you know, those differences are important. And so when you have somebody like Matt, who obviously lived in Chicago and can kind Chicago of bridge weird. the two, yeah. that's really yeah. valuable. For I mean, us. it kind of makes sense that that's how the people are, too, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. the, the New Yorkers, it's like a little harder, right? Right. right. And, and uh-huh. here it's not like my, I, I'm from New York, but my brother came out to visit me a couple of years ago. And we went to Venice. We were in Venice Beach. And he was weirded out by the fact that people were waving to him on the street as we walked by or, or like saying hello and nodding because yeah. people don't do that in New York just because yeah. you're inundated with so many different types of people and I think there's probably a casualness to the commercial reads as well along those lines right sort of, yeah. you know right. we're Californians we're easy going I mean we're not we're 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 but compared to New Yorkers right. or how people yeah. see New Yorkers it's more laid back right you know yeah. I'm a Californian now. <laughs> when did you when did you make that transition to be Californian from from New Yorker. You know, same for yeah. Chicago, because there's I, that, that same kind of a thing. Yeah. You know, I feel like a Californian, but I'm sure any Californian you ask, if I'm one of them, they will say, oh, no, Bo is a New Yorker. <laughs> but a, I'm not sure if New Yorkers own me anymore either, so I'm not sure. It's an odd I'm thing. I'm somewhere I in between. I think you're still, like, I think you're always whatever you were raised, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, I feel still feel like that strong Midwestern sort of set of values and everything. Yeah. Even though, like, I've, L.A. has been my home for a long time, you know, 15 yeah. years now or something. Yeah. And I kind of think Bo, like, I still catch the New York vibe right. from Bo. You know, like, I think, like... You just kind of say whatever's on your mind. It's yeah, totally exactly. it's whatever like, you say. But it's, it but, it's but it's but it's tinted with a little bit of Californian, so it's yeah, so yeah, yeah. The, the, well, it's like, coded. This is how I feel. Is that okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's how it goes. <laughs> the combo. Oh, man. Exactly. Whereas the Midwestern for me is like, I, I hope it's okay that yeah, I feel this way. I don't mean right, to interrupt exactly. you guys. Oh man, <laughs> uh, dude, I. I I really, I just absolutely love living in this city. Yeah. And because it is such a, a mixture of so many different backgrounds and experiences, and there is there is that urgency that I felt certainly in Chicago and, and advertising and, and, you know, boy, there was nothing worse than getting caught between your agent. <laughs> like I had a right. situation <laughs> where it was voiceover handled part of it and on camera handled part of it. Uh, and on camera booked me the job and it was this weird... Thing and I, it was it within was within the agency. No, two oh. separate agencies. Oh, I see. It was an uncomfortable spot to be in. And my on-camera agent, I mean, they they battled it out for like a couple days, and ultimately, my on-camera agent called. He was like, "Who brought you to me? Did I bring you to them, or did they bring you to me?" I was like, "They introduced me to you." I was like, okay, <laughs> then they can have it. So you know that happens. Wow. Yeah, that yeah. happens here too. It gets a little. Uh, the waters get a little muddied sometimes because of what we were talking about earlier in terms of like authenticity. We represent actors, so a lot of the people that we represent for voiceover, they have other representation for on camera. Now, a large majority of them are also with us for on camera commercials, but not all. So, when an advertiser doesn't want those voiceovery, voiceover announcery announcer people, sometimes they decide to send the casting to an on camera casting director so that they can hire the authentic, um, excuse me, the authentic yep. person. But what 
they don't realize is they're still getting the same people. They're just right. getting them a different way. Right. right. And unfortunately, it gets a little confusing because then it goes through an on-camera agent, but really it's still a voiceover job. Um, but luckily, you know, we have access to all the on-camera jobs because yeah. we have a on-camera department that's it's very near to us. And, you know, we've got very good relationships with all the on-camera casting directors in town. So usually whenever they put out a casting um, on the on-camera sites, uh, that are picture-based submissions, yeah. we usually have their ear and are able to send them demos and links for our talent to get them in on those castings. But it, it, it does get a little money sometimes because they think they're picking from a completely different pool of actors, but it's a lot of the same actors. Right. It's just yeah. you're getting them a different way. And it's like you were saying. It's like, well, you just said this very thing. It's like that those lines are so blurred yeah. and that so many people are in those things that so many on-camera people have come to voiceover because... Right. As I discovered too, it's like you're leaving money at the table if you're not chasing voiceover <laughs> right. as well. If yeah. you've got the skill set and you can do it, you should. Yeah. You know, because, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's tough to make a living. So right. why not? I mean, that's what it comes down to if you've got the skill set, right? right? Because it's like uh, we listen to demos all the time for people that, you know, could be competitive. They gave right. a decent read. And if we were a small new agencies uh, looking to fill our client roster, then we could take those people. Right. But, you know, we're covered with very talented people who have lots of different abilities and a big, wide uh, skill set. So we don't take on every person that submits to us that's talented. We pass on people all the time that are very talented. It's just a matter of, you know, we've already got the actors that we've stood behind who that who we want to sell. So uh, in terms of voiceover, yeah, it is, it is important to have the skill set. And if you've got it, you should have voiceover representation. But just because one agency passes on you doesn't mean you don't have it. Uh, right. You know, you just right. need that agency to believe in you. But, you know, what is... Uh, exciting to advertisers these days that like we talked about is different than it was 10 years ago mm. so the regular average guy uh, very much can have a successful voiceover career you don't have to be the guy who does 20 different voices even though those guys are great for us to have because right. they can work in animation and promo trailer narration and commercial and they can do all different sorts of things yeah. uh, you can still have a very nice lucrative career if you only have one read but it better be a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. is interesting because I, I will listen to commercials now and think, and we have a half a dozen guys at least who could, you know, that I could think of off the top of my head who could have done that read. It's just all become kind of very homogenized, you know, and um, and I don't know. I mean, it's just gotten more and more competitive. But but it, it I think what it proves is there's room for a lot more people now, you know, yeah. than, than even five or ten years ago. I mean, that's the thing. I, I say to a lot of my younger students who are coming in and, and just like it's – as competitive as it is, the thing that always gave me hope, and I, I really experienced this for the first time in Chicago, um, but then again here was like, you know – there's going to be more copy tomorrow. They're going to continue advertising. And if you don't win tomorrow, claim victory and depart the field. You can't, you can't dwell on what, what losses that you have. You have to stay positive and remind yourself that right. there's stuff coming. You know? Right. And also, like, commercially, you could go and not book anything for a year. But then the very next day, you could have booked, like, five television spots that are a six-figure career, you know? Yeah. But, um those little one-off radio spots, sure, they make you feel better. They make you feel better about your talent and, and your booking ability, but that's not what's paying your mortgage as an actor. It's right. the you know lucrative TV campaigns, and, and you never know when the next one is around the corner. You could go three years and not have one, and then the very next year you have four. So yeah. that's why it's important you know, to we give all of our clients you know some breathing room with that. A lot of people right. sign yeah. with us, and they say, like, so if I don't book my first 10 auditions, like, am I out? How does that work? Obviously not. Like if we see ability there and and believe in the reads and the verse and and what we're hearing, then we give it a lot of time, you yeah. know, to to see how it pans out. And I think we're unique among agents mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, like we really really want you to book and we like like we hate dropping people. You know what I mean? Like yeah. we, we Some will do everything. Love it. We, I know. Huh? They really yeah. enjoy it. They yeah. really. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but I mean, we will make try as hard as we can and put it off as long as we can before we <laughs> yeah. release somebody but sometimes it just doesn't work and and that's yeah. just the nature of right. the industry and everything and but. we have and we have people that we we've also we sit we have these meetings you know we you know quarterly or whatever of people that just really aren't cutting it we have to let go and um we've all agreed on certain people 
that need to leave, right? <laughs> and uh, one of the agents will just kind of drag their feet on it a little bit because they just don't want to do it. And thank God, sometimes, right. because... Why? There are certain people that we represent right now, hopefully you know who you are, um, <laughs> um, who, um, who that almost happened with, and then shortly thereafter started booking campaign after commercial after campaign after commercial, and right. now has a very Series, nice, you know, yeah, yeah, has just, a very nice voiceover career, you know, so uh, it just goes to show you never know. Like, it could be a bust for two years, but then all of a sudden it just gets turned around. And in the past, we used to have these meetings to to, to address when it's not working. Mm. And sometimes just that fire under yeah. you, that also yeah. makes a change. So uh-huh. it's important to never get lazy about it. You right. know, Don't just phone it in all the time because if you do that, you're not really ever going to turn anything around. You know, That right. seems like the, the kind of the, the biggest error that someone who's a veteran could do is just kind of start going, I got this. Yeah. yeah, and and you know, a, a, you know, a, you just slowly watch your. Even if you're batting initially 400, and you start sliding into the low 300s, is my baseball analogy skin? <laughs> yeah, 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 okay, yeah, good. Yeah. You know, and then then you're at 297. You're like, what am I doing? And it's because you're just not swinging for the fences anymore. Yeah, and you yeah. you gotta stay hungry and yeah. work on your skill set and train and. I mean, there's listen. yeah, there's so many elements though to it, right? right. Like obviously, yeah. you only have control over what what you can do. Certainly. You know, some of it has to do with your agents' relations relationships with buyers. Some of it mm-hmm. has to do with um, with um, you know, well, like I said, there's like the opportunity itself. So, or or what the industry is like, or is it going to celebrities, or is it going non-union? There's a lot of different things at play in terms of you know how successful your career is. But what you have control over, you got to keep that in check. Mm-hmm. So. I 100%. I mean, we have so many people who have so so much potential, uh, and sometimes it just goes wasted, you know. Mm-hmm. And and the most frustrating thing I think for an agent is to hear, "I need more copy. I, I need more opportunity." It's like, well, what are you putting into this, uh-huh. you know, to to book the things that we're giving you, you know? And I think that, like, you know, you you just need to kind of put that work in, and you have. You know, as Paul would say, you have a great instrument, like you got to learn how to play it, you know. Yeah. So, you know, it's that kind of work that it's a partnership. I think, yeah. you know, yeah, we're, totally. we're trying to work on your behalf and we need you to sort of, you know, step up as well. Right. Yeah. And I have a female client who I've spoken with. I won't name her because I, I don't think she would want to be named. But I, I love, like what Samita said, it is a partnership. There are things that you as an actor will know because you just go to, you go to the sessions. You have two or three hour sessions sometimes with these producers you get to know their fan about their families you get to know about their lives about what they're wanting from you and so that's information as an agent I don't always have hmm. um, so what this uh, talent always does is she does a research you know and she, before she does a session you know she she looks up some of the spots that she sees online that that same advertiser has done and she makes herself aware of what the producer has produced before and and that helps her book the jobs and I really yeah. appreciate that she does that I don't think that takes anything away from me as an agent I still have the connection and and there's things that I'm doing for her that she can't do but we're all in this together. The point is to book the job. Right. So thank you for doing extra work to try to book the job and not just putting it out there, right. you know, in a 30-second read and that's it. Like, I appreciate it when talent do the work behind the scenes. And if you do, let me know about it because it just makes you appreciate me appreciate you that much more. Oh, that's great. Know? Like you. Yes, as an exactly. actor, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as an actor, when you have downtime, like when it's slow for you theatrically, you're you're putting together a podcast or, yeah. you know, you're doing sketches or you're doing something else. I mean, you're always keeping busy. And I think that's important, especially yeah. in a world where actors, you know, a lot of them are creating their own jobs nowadays. Yes. You know, like uh, people are being discovered on YouTube. Right. So you have to stay active with that stuff and you can't just wait for the opportunities to come to you. You have to make them. And then you're helping your agents sell you when opportunities arise as well so I think it's important to stay active like you do in all the different ways that you possibly can as an actor otherwise you're just sitting there waiting for the phone to ring well I think if you're an artist you're called to create in whatever what 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 however that manifests itself you know right. I might want to call my shots and be like oh I want to play this role in this show and I want to focus on that and then I, a long time ago a long, I don't say a long time ago we were in Cleveland and uh, just struggling our way through being in Cleveland. <laughs> and there was no union work in town, or precious little. Mm-hmm. And, and everybody, a lot of the actors that we would talk to would like, man, I should be this, 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 and this. 
And and kind of the saying in our house, Sharon, I would say all all the time, is like you you got to have the career you're having, and 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 make the most of whatever that is. And if that's if that's regional radio spots in Toledo, Ohio, so be it. If you want to grow beyond that, then then get bigger than the bathtub that you're in. Sorry, I'm mixing all my metaphors. <laughs> it was a, a goldfish in a right. bathtub. You get bigger. You know what I mean? Right, right, like right. like outgrow your market. Right. And and then yeah. explore rather than dropping into a place where you think, oh, uh, man, I'm not getting the opportunities I should be getting. I need to go this place. No matter where you go, there you are. Right. You know? Yeah. Well, and it really helps us, too. Like, if we're trying to sell some, back to the authenticity thing or, yeah. or not even necessarily, if I'm trying to sell someone to a casting director for an appointment time and I'm like, no, I swear, he's really funny. He's the funny guy. We have people that are so insanely funny, and I know that any piece of copy I put in front of them, they're going to knock it out of the park. But the casting director, they don't believe it always. They need to see it, right? So uh-huh. it's helpful sometimes when I'm like, this person is hysterical. Here's their YouTube link. Check out their sketches. Right. See, right. they're funny. Like, I have a lot of people, like I said, who could nail it, but that's not enough always anymore. You have to show them. So huh. that's another reason. Even in voiceover, it's good to be always doing stuff definitely definitely and even you know just sort of make your agents aware of who you are and you know we have so many people now with the ease of like mp 3 on your phone or that never come in and it's hard to kind of build a relationship because even if like i know something personal about you that i can use to sort of get you an audition time yeah that's because you you know personally come in here all the time and we get to see you yeah. You know, the guy who sort of sends his reads from home and it comes in maybe once a year. Like, we just wouldn't know those things about him, you know? Yeah. So it's just, it's helpful on all sorts of levels, I think, to have that relationship. That makes a lot of sense. I feel like, I feel like the, the perception in, in my head has been in the past, in previous places, well, I don't want to roll in there. Maybe it's Midwestern. Maybe it's That's, maybe yeah. it's maybe it's the perception of Hollywood as this thing, and who am I to come in with holding my hat in my hand? Um, but like, it's made up of people who have full lives, right? And just and I, I mean, it's one of the things that I love about about being with you guys and have been is that I mean, I mean, we're not hanging out every Saturday drinking mimosas, but we're we're friends. Right. You know what I right. mean? And I feel right. that way about everybody who works yeah. here. And I think that's really important that you want to nurture this relationship yeah. because it's like it's it's not yeah. this, well, my my agent is this thing and I have to put on my agent show when I go into the agency yeah. and be like, oh, I've got so much going on. Right. You know? I mean, listen, we love when people do that because we've got some really funny clients and I love a little five-minute, you know, laugh fest. Uh-huh. But it's not necessary for us. You know, the, there is a very old-school agency out there. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about one in specifically, but uh, where they put a wall up. They don't want uh, right. to let you in because they want to have all the control in terms of who they put on what and and what they know is right, and that's and that's it. And so we, we try to be open-minded. We, we want to know about you. We want you to come in let us know about what you're doing and it'll only help us to sell you and help the relationship be mutually beneficial Um, so I would like to think that you know we're great we're hungry agents but also you can talk to us you don't have to come in and do the schmooze just be real with us and you know we'll want to sell you yeah absolutely I mean we're a pretty informal group I mean you know it's uh, and you I mean, you can always tell when we're busy or on the phone Certainly. or something. But generally, you know, we want you know, we like seeing our clients and we want to know more about them and you know all that stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think some people call it the runway. You just kind of meet, <laughs> exactly. you walk, right, right, right. you walk down, you wave, yep. you smile, and if people are not on the phone or looking stressed out or busy, you stop and talk a little bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, if they look slammed, you know, obviously a wave will do. Yes. But, you know, you don't do it every day because right, then right. we'll start to think you're moving in. <laughs> exactly. but, uh, but the occasional, you know, once a week or, or once every two weeks or something, it doesn't, it certainly doesn't hurt. Yeah. And I would also say, if people are going to come in to stop and say hello, you usually have something to talk about. That would be great. Because <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I've had clients, uh, when I'm in the middle of something busy, uh, I have no problem taking some time to stop and talk. But I've had, you know, talent just come and stand in front of me and go, Hi. <laughs> it's always a little so, bit awkward. Oh, it's I'm like, like, 
hello. <laughs> very, this very kind of deliberate, like, okay, I'm putting my time I'm talking in. This is my you. effort. Yeah. Right. But, you know, I, I appreciate, I have a couple of clients. One of them happens to be, uh, you know, very my sister, let's just say, who, uh, <laughs> who is represented by her New York office, you know, doesn't want to be an authentic and do the schmooze. And, and I appreciate when someone doesn't want to do the schmooze. It means you're not a fake person, you know. Yeah. But uh, don't think of it that way. It doesn't have to be fake. You know, you can right. go in and communicate with people honestly. It doesn't have to be about, hey, here's what I did yesterday, and here, here's how good I am at this voice, and, and I right. could do this and that. It doesn't have to be that. Those things will come up organically and naturally. Yeah, and it's not like I'm coming in to remind you. I, I know that you guys know what, I know that for, for all of us, that every one of us, that you guys probably know what our skill sets are beyond what we know about ourselves in a way. You, you guys have seen what we're capable of and, yeah. you know, hear, you know, from the good, the bad, and the ugly from all of us to know where our strengths and where our, some of our weaknesses lie Yeah, and, and that kind of stuff. So... There's no point in doing anything other than coming in and just being yourself. But but we're surprised sometimes. You know, I have a, a hmm. former booth director who helped me book a commercial job because, the, what was it for? It was a car campaign and they were looking for Oh, their, yeah. yeah. What, what is this hypnotist. called? Hypnotist. Yeah. They wanted a hypnotist read. And our former booth director, uh, Steve, was like, did you know this person is a hypnotist in real life? I had no clue. There's really? no reason I would have known that. Right. I've only ever known him as an actor. Turned out he booked it. And it turned out to be a pretty lucrative campaign That's because great. of that information so yeah. you know just like a producer might know or an actor might know more about a producer because of spending sessions with them uh, our booth directors know sometimes more than we do because uh. they're in the booth with them so often and yeah. they just talk about things naturally while they're recording right. things so interesting yeah and, and then another good thing about us is we sit in this large open room yeah. and we all hear each other talk even when we're not trying to include each other so <laughs> I might you know I, out yeah. loud I'm sometimes saying you know who does a good cowboy or, or mm. something like that? And and everyone pipes in from all corners. <laughs> I pipe in sometimes to the on-camera department's thoughts out loud. Uh, right. You know, like Deidre's like, do we have any Germans? And I'm like, what about that person that you met last year? So That's so awesome. But it's a good environment for that because we yeah. all, there's no way people get forgotten or, or certain abilities get forgotten because we're always bouncing it off of each other. And we're yeah. hearing what each other's booking too which is huh. helpful too because it's sort of you know you remember that so and so booked something for right. Kathy Lizio and, right. and they're actually calling for that here you know so it, it's we're aware of what each other's doing right yeah like sometimes Vinny might book some in the promo trailer narration department. He might book someone on a Siri type robot voice. Yeah. And so now we know they can do that, and we sell them that way. Or maybe you know the animation department books someone on a sports read for a for a animated series that they did, and now they become someone that we submit for those things. Uh, so it happened, does cross over all the time. That happened for me doing Hanks. Like I did Hanks for uh, for Vinny a bunch last year, and Brittany heard it and got me on Family Guy doing Hanks. Perfect. There you go. So Perfect. like I I. I uh, <laughs> I've experienced that very thing that yes. you're describing. Right. So if you're not going to be in an agency where there's one person who reps you for everything and right. anything, it's good to be at a place where everyone has an open line of communication. Right. Yeah. You know. Quick question about about home recording. You mentioned people sending in auditions on iPhones and stuff like that. Like, does that swing? Like, is it is it good enough to submit, or do you get feedback from clients that's kind of like, eh, at least don't send us any more of these, or like, um, for the most part, it's gotten pretty sophisticated. I think if you have the right app, if you have the, and you, and mo more importantly, if you're recording it in the right space, mm. physical space, uh, it's it's probably good enough for an audition purpose. It's probably good enough. Um, we've had people, you know, pull over uh, with a last minute audition recorded in their car. Cars are a really good place to record. Yeah. By the way, the acoustics are great, um, and they booked it. You know, um, I, by the same token, I was talking to. Somebody at an ad agency a couple of years ago, they were casting a big celeb campaign, and everybody auditioned for it. And uh, a celebrity auditioned it in their bathroom, and you could tell it was from their bathroom. And, you know, that kind of, like, turned them off a little bit, even though yeah. this is a huge star. Right. You know, so it's just... I, and I don't think it's the phone necessarily. It's obviously a big echoey space that just... Right. You know, so that's the crucial thing. Way but, you're recording. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it would be nice if everybody had a, a big setup like, you know, most of our, uh, a lot of our, you know, clients do. 
But in a pinch, you know, if I really want your audition, I'd be happy to take it off of the phone, you know, if I feel yeah. like you're perfect for it, you know, and I've right. only got an hour to get it. Yeah. Know. That's what it comes down to, being perfect for it, though, because we do not get calls from buyers. It's so rare where they'll actually take the time to say, hey, I listened to so-and-so's audition and the quality was awful. Don't send that person to me anymore. They, they won't tell you that. They'll just nix the audition and who knows if they'll consider you again. So you mm-hmm. don't want that to ever be a reason why you're cut out of the mix yeah. because of the recording quality. Right. So, you know, yeah, the quality has to be decent. But like he said, the mic on an iPhone is perfectly decent. It's, it's about where you're recording now in terms of auditioning purposes that – that matters right but mm. um yeah so that definitely could cut you out of a job if the recording quality isn't decent but if you're perfect for it they might be willing to yeah. put it in the mix anyway but you have to keep in mind from the ad agency's perspective they've been hired and paid a lot of money to find the perfect voice for this campaign and usually what happens is they'll present a select few typically three to their client as these are the best of them we did all this work for you and we chose these these are the best so imagine if this client has paid all this money to this advertiser and they get you know one that sounds like it's recorded in a, in a taxi cab one that sounds like it was recorded in a stairwell and you know the other one in a bathroom right. the, the client is going to say what did we just pay you for you know these right. are professional auditions so why would the client choose to put those auditions forward if hmm. they don't sound professional. And you're competing against hundreds and hundreds of other actors, many of whom know how lucrative voiceover can be. They they know, you know, how to make it sound perfectly. They're going to spend the time yeah. to get those auditions to sound as perfectly as possible. So, you know, again, even within reason, you got to have your A game, you know, even if you have an hour to audition, try to make it sound as good as possible. And, yeah. You know. Dude, this has been fantastic. There's been so much. Uh, this is incredibly helpful and 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 insightful and fun conversation. Oh, good. As yeah. I and Thanks, fun. Yeah. as I sit here and quarterback it. What's what's um. Well, uh, two things. What one? Uh, uh, do you get auditions that you don't send? Do you do you filter stuff out and be like I I mean I assume like it's like send top ten. You might ask for 20 so that you can make your decision and make sure that you put your best foot forward. Um, like, what, what in that, what do you, what do you, what's going to make your top 10? What's going to make right. your, you know? I will say it, it is rare that I cut people unless it's completely wrong. Like, uh-huh. oh, you know, I thought that would work, but it definitely doesn't. And do I you don't do a redirect on that? Or generally you're kind of well, like, no, no it's not time. if I feel like I was so far off base, it was a little bit pointless, then maybe I'll cut that audition. But it is rare because the majority of what me and I do <clears throat> is not something that could be where you could give a read that was that far off base. Yeah. You know, the majority of the stuff we right. work on is 30 to 40 year old mom or 30 to 45 year old dad. Like, how can you be so wrong for that character? (laughs) Right. Uh, You can't really. It's hard to be wrong for that, right? So I think that the majority of the time, uh, well, we almost never cut auditions. But, and another reason we don't is because there's been times I've been so surprised on what they went with. So, you know, it's, I try to make the best opinion on what I think is going to book and put those people forward. But, Sometimes I'm wrong. You know, the buyer has a totally different point of view than I do sometimes, and, and they went with something that I never would have chosen. Mm. So I've I've submitted auditions before that I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is not right. Like, I, I had a group read across the hall once, and I had um, two upper 20-something-year-old women do a read. And it's supposed to be sexual. That's the joke. That was the joke of the group read. Okay. And they sounded like 13-year-old girls. I was, wow. like, weirded out by how awkward it sounded because they sounded so young even though these women were almost in their 30s those women booked it and I almost didn't send them because I thought it might be offensive uh, but they liked that quality about it that it was awkward (laughs) that's what they wanted for the campaign Wow! so that stuff happens sometimes where you think wow that was wrong but it worked so we're not you know this is not math it's it can go anyway I, and it's the same here. I mean, it's rare that I cut anything. And if I do, it's, you know, it, it nobody that we have is so wrong for something. But it may just be 
you know, it, I can just tell their heart's not quite in it or some mm. sort of thing. And it's all subjective, really. Yeah. You know, but if anything, I've actually started submitting more people on projects <laughs> because, you know, for, we it's gotten so unpredictable. And uh-huh. I feel yeah, like, yeah. you know, what is the harm in submitting, you know, three or four extra auditions, particularly with buyers that I know and producers that I've worked with before. Yeah. Like, I feel like they're willing to cut me a little bit of slack there. And, you know, I want to give more opportunities to people right. um, because it, you know, you don't want to say anybody can book a commercial, but it's gotten to that point now where, you know, there, anyone can book a commercial. Anyone <laughs> can book a commercial. Yeah, right. Well, you don't yeah, want to be exactly. the guy who's got the, got the booking reads sitting on your hard drive. You didn't send right, it in exactly. because you didn't take that risk. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is great. Yeah, but I, in terms of taking a risk, I, I like it yeah. on those special ones when people take a little bit of a risk because, you know, with most of our copy, it kind of is what it is. Yeah. And because there's so many auditions being put forward, it's, you know, you, everyone just kind of blends together sometimes. So if you do something a little bit more unique, it works. But, you know, listen, it has to be something that, that's asking for it, something that wants some improv, you know, or whatever. If they're yeah. looking for a bank read, don't give some crazy character. You know, it's right, not right, right. going to be appropriate for that. Right. But, you know, there's certain it, – it, it typically it lends its hand it, itself more to radio copy. And yes. then the occasional talking Doritos bag or, you know, talking Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Those are the things where I think it's a little looser where you could – give it something with your own flavor. Sure. Um, and I appreciate it when people do something unique and add something special that's not necessarily on the copy. Right. Hmm. Right. Hmm. I've been messing with slates lately. It was something Fraley said and I thought was interesting and I, I didn't want it to sound stupid. <laughs> but, I, but at the same time, I don't know, you're just looking for ways to yeah. be interesting yeah. and I innovative and, and do 100%. stuff and take some risks and I know, I trust you guys to be like, hey, uh, hey, hey, knock it off. I'm like, okay, no problem. We've had people, I, you know, had somebody uh, had a callback essentially, and they said, we want her to read it like she did her slate. Wow. And so that's how much they're paying attention to yeah. the stuff now, because wow. I think in a way, you know, your slate is probably the most authentic thing on your read, right. you know? Yeah. It's like you, you say your name, and then you take a beat, and then all of a sudden you're putting on a performance, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. That, that happens so many... And, like, I oh, had an right. actress that I would, you know, when I was in the booth, would say, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to say your name. You're not going to take a beat at all. You're just going to go straight into it, because I didn't want her to have Put the time to kind of prepare yeah. something, oh, you right. know? But but it is, you mm-hmm. know, slates are important, too. That's an yeah. aspect that people... Uh, Agreed. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and commercially only is how we're speaking. Right. Because, you know, I know that the animation agents have yeah. different interests for their auditions. And yeah. even both of them have different likes in terms of their auditions. Yeah. But for commercials, I usually like the slate to be in the character that you're going to do in the script. Otherwise, okay. it sounds inauthentic. Because, like, right. you know, a character that we often get or a reference we often get is Sam Elliott, right? Yeah. So if you... If you if you do your slate completely normal and then all of a sudden you go into this place, <laughs> so they go, okay, that was wrong. Yeah. And we have some, you know, British actors who do an amazing American accent. But if their slate isn't British and then their read isn't an American accent, I think it just throws everybody off and, and they don't want to go that way. Yeah. It's so. like this this idea of like, oh, I'm, watch my magic trick. Watch my watch my spectacular magic trick. Yes. You, I kind of think you have to think of your audition as as a small little piece of art of like and and it has to it has to be curated in that way you know and it has to be on, on my end before i send it to you guys that it's like here's my little interpretation of said script uh, right. you're welcome and then go, <laughs> right. go from there you know what i mean well but, i mean yeah. one little other thing I, i've always liked about commercials and, and voiceover commercials as well um, it's the only time i think as an actor that you actually get to deliver a full performance in your audition yeah you know? so like take advantage of that. Like show us the whole range of that journey. You know, like, I because I think you're gev- given a chance to actually show us what you're going to do with the final spot, as opposed to a theatrical thing where it's a scene or something. And, yeah, you know, where it's a fragment of yeah. something that you're you're. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, how can people find you on social media? Are you okay with people following you on social Absolutely. media? Like yeah. and. and uh... Where, yeah. where, are you, where are you So, guys at? Smeet and I have a little competition because oh, really? we, we joined Twitter like right around the same time. Uh-huh. And at any given point, like he's 50 up on me or I'm 50 up on him. And I think it's kind of just become a game on like who right. can get more followers. All right. Well, this is but a nice even starting point. Yeah. And it's so unfortunate that we don't have time to give your Twitter handle. Bo, so, but join mine me. Is Smeet so at CESD. Oh, that's actually, no, sorry. Uh, no, it's Bo Oliver CESD uh, is my Instagram. Uh, 
handle as well as my Twitter handle. So B E A U Oliver C E S D for and both. Mine is uh, Samit at C E S D on Twitter, Samit Iyengar on Instagram. Awesome. You guys, thank you so much for taking the time and. Uh, yeah. This was awesome. <laughs> yeah. I hope you had fun. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Should we? Yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Generally, no. No one usually has <laughs> yeah, no, questions. Thanks for, for having us on. It was a blast. Thank you. Yeah, this thank you so much, you guys.